Where I wanted to start today was kind of a little bit before NREL. This is uh, our, we're getting ready for our 40th anniversary, and, um, which is this July. But I want to step back a little bit further and talk a little bit about the conservation movement that started in the United States in the, in the uh, late 1800s. Some names that you'll, you'll recognize there, John Muir and, and, and Roosevelt and others. And there's a picture of, of Roosevelt and Muir at Great Glacier Point overlooking the Yosemite Valley, which was one of the first battlegrounds relative to developing some conservation in the nation as we grew and were foresting and doing and mining and doing things just kind of as at will. Uh, we decided at this point that it was a, a good time to start some na the national park system and to have some conservation measures in the, in, the, uh, in the country. As we rolled into the 60s and after the World War II industrialization, we, we found that we were putting a whole lot of waste into our environment. Rivers were catching on fire. We were having a huge amount of oil spills. Um, uh, a lot of hazardous materials. Uh, <clears throat> we started getting some good public attention. And around that time, we developed uh, the first uh, thoughts about environmentalism and, and, and taking care of, of the waste and the, and the natural resources that we have here uh, in the United States. And that brought along the first Earth Day on April 20th, 1970. Um, in the 60s brought a, a lot of, of, of interest, and Gaylord Nelson and Representative Pete McCloskey uh, recruited Dennis Hayes uh, to run the first um, Earth Day. He also ran the 20th Earth Day. Um, and later on, he uh, became the second director of SERI. SERI was the, the precursor of NREL. Before we were a national laboratory, we were the Solar Energy Research Institute. Um, that came about by the uh, Congress put out a Solar Energy Research Act uh, right after, during the oil, oil embargo times, there was a, 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 an acknowledgement that the nation needs to do some more work on, on renewables. So a company called uh, um, Midwest uh, MRI Global out of Kansas City found this section of land here on a, on a federal um, reservation, the, the, the old army reservation, and, and uh, uh, won the first contract to put SERI in, in place. We later on became uh, a, a, a national lab. So Dennis led the first, uh, it's kind of interesting, a 10-year uh, difference of pictures here when he was running Earth Day versus when he was running NREL. But the, the, the first Earth Day and that environmental movement of the 70s is what spawned all the major environmental regulations that we currently have today that keep, keep us uh, in, a, in a clean environment. The Clean Air Act and the National Environmental Policy Act were just prior to the, to the first Earth Day and then after that Clean Air Act, Occupational Safety Act, Water Pollution, Safe Drinking Water, RICRA, TOSCA, all the major uh, regulations. They, they definitely slowed down since then. We've got a lot of things covered here now. The laboratories also made some major impacts, bringing a number of our uh, executive branch folks here. Um, this uh, photo here is, is when the uh, lab became uh, was designated as a national laboratory. We celebrate Earth Day every year. Uh, and in fact, we celebrate it for a week long. Um, two years ago, Dennis Hayes came to visit, and we actually had him speaking to all of our staff at, at, at lunchtime. It was great to have him here. He's in uh, Seattle, runs a, 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 a facility up there, a net zero facility. Here we have the, net, the research support facility, which is a net zero energy facility. There they have different water law, and they can actually even be net zero at, at, uh, at water. So we do a number of different things. We've got a little bluegrass band that's uh, um, all employees at NREL that we play in the cafeteria. We do a couple of different nature walks. Last year we did a ride and drive of renewable uh, or of electric vehicles. 
uh, handed out some trees, electronics recycling we just finished this morning, good bikes, uh, which is a donation of bikes that goes to Goodwill. So just a number of things we try and do all week long to keep our, our employees' perspectives into uh, Earth Week. So let's get to the lab and, and give you some perspectives on who we are and what we do. We were founded as SERI in 77, as I mentioned, uh, designated as a national lab in 91. We're managed by MRI Global, the same company that started NREL, along with Patel Memorial. It's a 50-50 partnership, and they own the Alliance for Sustainable Energy, and we manage the subcontract for the Department of Energy. So it's a Department of Energy lab, but most of the people who work here are, are uh, subcontractors for the Alliance for Sustainable Energy, other than the DOE folks that we have here that oversee us, but also do work for, uh, the, for the EERE, Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy component of the Department of Energy. Uh, so there's about 200 there, about 20 of them oversee NREL and the rest oversee uh, or, or work for EERE. So EERE's strategic goals are uh, really transportation, renewable power, energy efficiency. You can see that. I won't read it through there. And <clears throat> to accelerate the development and adoption of sustainable transportation, generation of, of electricity from renewables, uh, and then when we get down to number six, lead efforts to improve federal sustainability and implementation of clean energy solutions. The EERE wants to make sure that the, that the federal government is doing its best to operate in a sustainable manner also, per Executive Order 13693, which is for the federal uh, government to take a leadership in how we operate and minimizing the amount of resources that we use, uh, minimizing the amount of waste that we put out. So some principles of, of renewable power, and I'm going to grab a quick drink while you, while you take a look at that. So we want uh, to drive down cost in for renewables. That's al always the key. It's always a financial decision when you decide how you, what, what your power grid is going to look like. Um, regardless of how right you want to be and make the right decisions, economics still makes a big decision, uh, difference. Uh, validate the risk, uh, risk, risk reduction of using renewables so that people and companies are more uh, apt to build and to buy. Uh, and reduce market barriers that are out there. A lot of those market barriers are around policy, around, around uh, government policy. So we're a uh, world-class facility. We're one of the most renowned uh, la laboratories for renewable energy and energy efficiency research. We've got about 1,700 employees. That's full-time employees. We probably have another 200 to 250 students that we bring in uh, every summer, in addition to postdocs that are, that are in uh, doing work and uh, researchers that are coming in from other countries doing shared research. Um, we model this campus. We've tried to, to, to build it and to operate it in the most sustainable fashion possible. And uh, the uh, CU uh, LEED School does an impact study of the amount of, of, of funding, economic impact that comes from this lab. Just in the state of Colorado, that's about $700 million. Uh, and, and, and nationally, it's more like nearly $900 million. By the way, we operate on a budget of about 400 million is what we, a little less than that, uh, that, that is our annual operating budget. By the way, so, so what we produce is IP, is, is in intellectual property. So we're, we're not manufacturing chips that are going to go out and be sold on, a, on the market or wind turbines that are going to be sold. What we do is we do research on wind turbines and PV arrays and hydrogen and, and batteries and things of that nature. So our, our product is intellectual property. So um, a lot of what we do is put together patents and things like that that then people can, can buy and that money goes back into the research mode. Oh, and I'll also say about 
85% of our budget is out of the Department of Energy. Uh, the other 15% typically is from other government agencies, maybe the Department of Homeland Security or Commerce or someone has some special projects that they want us to work on, or independent uh, commercial companies, uh, British Petroleum might want to do some work on biofuels, those kind of things. So that's what our, our, our budgets look like. So some of the impacts that we've made over the, over the last few years, and these are um, 2014, 15 numbers, but it just gives you kind of a perspective. So the cost of solar energy has fallen 96% uh, over the last few years. I mean, we have driven down the cost of, of, of PV to the point where the soft costs of, doing, of getting an interconnection agreement and, and doing the installation are actually the, the higher part of the project, not the cost of the panel itself. On the, on the wind side, wind has dropped drastically. In fact, it's the cheapest electricity, electrical power that you can put on the grid. It has been for quite some time. In fact, more wind has gone on the grid in the last five years than any other type of, of generation, coal, uh, natural gas, whatever uh, it might be. In fact, uh, Excel Energy, our energy provider here, is at 18% renewables. They've done an extremely good job of moving into renewables, and, mo and, and the big part of that is wind. In fact, they are now building a $6 billion wind uh, farm on their own because the, the, the value of wind is, is, is so, so good there. Um, bioenergy, um, most of our um, alcohols are coming from food, from corn. Our focus is to convert biomass to uh, cellulosic alcohol. So we're using corn stover or things that are left in the field or, or switchgrass or things like that to make alcohol rather than food products. We've uh, dropped that price to that, it, that it's now within um, the uh, effectiveness and plants are starting to pop up around the nation. So let's talk a little bit about sustainability. What is, what is that and, and what does it mean? You know, the, the, the Brent Commission, the UN Brent Commission, after the 20th Earth Day convened and def defined a, a definition of sustainability. And that was being able to complete your mission without impacting the mission of others. Three components of sustainability are, are financial, economic, and social. You have to have all three legs of the stool for under your business to make sure it's going to be successful to, uh, and, and sustainable. So here we look at what we do makes the nation's energy, energy supply more sustainable. The, the biggest greenhouse gas impact that we have is from our fuels and from our electricity. And so our focus on the, doing the research that we do for the nation is to drive those costs down so that we have more green energy, we have less greenhouse gas, so our mission is really sustainable, and how we operate we, to be sustainable, we want to minimize the amount of, of resources we use and, and minimize the amount of waste that goes out. So it's really about effectiveness and efficiency. That is sustainability to us. So our campus mission is to integrate sustainability throughout all of our decision making of our campus operations, our, our strategic decisions, how are we going to build, if we're going to build a building, how are we going to build it? Where are we going to build it? Uh, if we're putting in a new computer, how, what, how are we going to cool that computer? So making strategic decisions <clears throat> so that we can have, uh, operate a sustainable campus. And, and why is that important? Well, we want to be the model of sustainability. It's what we do. And so we should have it on our campus and we should be an example of that. We also want to attract a world-class world-class workforce. Folks that are the best and the brightest out there all over the world working in renewables, they want to be on a campus and work on a campus that walks the talk. So you got to know where you're going. So we set long-term goals. We don't know if we'll reach these, but these are, these are our aspirations. We have the world's largest net zero energy building, but we also want a net zero energy campus. How do we get to a place where all the energy we use is, is renewable. That's really hard to do in a regulated state. 
you can't just go to Excel and say, here, we're going to pay extra and we want all wind. You actually can, but what you're doing is you're buying renewable energy credits. So that is a goal of ours is to become a total net zero energy campus. Um, to demonstrate uh, energy systems integration, how do we make sure that we're doing, uh, that we're managing the the electricity in our building smartly. That we know that we, when it's time to replace a generator, or that all of our valves and our HVAC systems are opening correctly. So, being using a very smart energy systems integration facility, we want to reduce our scope three greenhouse gas. I'll talk a little bit about more more about that in a minute. But scope three is relative to employee commuting travel, ancillary things like that, that we want to figure out how do we drive those down and, and to, to educate the public. Um, we've, been, we've had a sustainability program for quite some time. Uh, back in 2000, we established the first one. And, and to my knowledge, it's the oldest sustainability program in federal government. The federal government has a number of, of um, goals relative to sustainability metrics. In fact, there are 32 different goals. And all of those goals, they are things like lower your energy intensity, increase the amount of renewables that you have, lower the amount of petroleum that you're using. All of those goals are absolute goals. In other words, they are saying reduce the amount of petroleum you used from 2008 to now by 20%. And they don't care if we doubled the amount of people, that we doubled the amount of cars, they don't care how we do it because the government, I mean, the, the environment doesn't care, does it? It doesn't care if we doubled our population, it cares are we minimizing the amount of fuel that we burn. So this, this slide gives you a perspective of where we were in 2006 and, and, and how big our campus was versus now uh, with a new garage the research support facility, the ESIF building, the energy systems integration facility, the uh, parking garage, so, uh, stormwater pond. So we've added a considerable amount of, of footprint, yet we are still doing extremely well on those sustainability goals, and I'll, and I'll uh, touch on those in just a second. We do that because we really try and, Im and implement the research that we're doing here on campus. And a number of the things that we're uh, doing are actually paid research projects. For an example, the electric vehicle charging. We have 36 electric vehicle stations in our, in our parking garage. And according uh, to um, federal requirements, we cannot uh, allow employees to charge on that without paying for their electricity. But what we do here is we do a research project on their use of that electricity, allowing them not to have to pay that because they're in, they've signed an agreement that says, I'm in going to partake in this research and not hold anybody liable and be able to do that. So, and, and we're talking about, so this is about 42 cents a day is, is on the high side is what the cost of electricity is, by the way, if you're looking at buying an electric vehicle and, and, you're, and you're thinking, what, how much would I save over, over gas? So that, that's kind of a good number to think about, about 42 cents a day in electricity. Um, we, uh, we have this net zero office building, but just because you designed it and built it that way doesn't mean it's going to stay net zero. There's a data center in it. There are people coming and going. There are new, new equipment going in. So modeling that data and, 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 and watching it and, and metering it on a, on a daily basis is important to make sure that we're going to stay a net zero energy building. Um, retrofitting and commissioning a lot of our older buildings, making sure that we're bringing them up to speed, and that we're making them as efficient as we can. Energy, uh, intelligent energy management is what I talked about earlier, monitoring the electricity use in all of your buildings and, and your HVAC systems and knowing is everything operating properly and am I operating it as smart as I can. 
We've just entered into the Strategic Energy Management Certification for ISO 50001. We're the first federal facility to do that. We just passed first phase one two weeks ago of the audit. We've got another one that I think is in the next week or two, and then we'll be the first federal facility to have that, uh, that certification, and we'll use it to help train other federal facilities on the benefits of, of um, ISO 50001 certification. We focus on bringing the, uh, uh, as many renewables as we can on site, and a lot of that is done through power purchase agreements, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, the transportation of our employees and how they get to work. So um, how, how do we try and in, 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 uh, uh, help people to carpool, to vanpool, uh, uh, to more efficiently get to, get to work? Um, high efficient computing. Computing is one of the most energy efficient, energy uh, intensive um, operations that you will have. The supercomputer that we installed on this campus has the capacity in the next five years to double the amount of electricity we use on this campus just from that computing system. So <clears throat> it's very important to uh, to manage your uh, computing to be as efficient as possible. And I will get to that in a couple more slides. Climate resilience. We are seeing the, the climate change in, in our own neighborhoods. And so we did a resilience action plan to look at what was forecast for the regional area and what should we be thinking about in long-term planning to make sure that this campus is as resilient as possible. And then we do things like commercial demonstrations on site. For instance, a couple of the shuttles that we have that, that run the, uh, the, the circulators on campus have a, a hydraulic hybrid system. So it's kind of like a, a, a hybrid electric vehicle where you're charging a battery and you're using that, that battery to, to run a couple of motors to assist your electrical or your, your, your gas motor. Um, this vehicle, basically, when you hit the brake, it takes the it, it, it takes that energy and and and, and um, puts hydraulic fluid into six different tanks and stores that at a higher pressure. When you start the vehicle off, you hit the gas. It uses that pressure to start to turn the drive shaft and get the immediate push. So what we found with this, and this is a company out of um, Loveland that we did an agreement with to put them on our, our shuttles. Our subcontractor was agreeable to do that. And what we found in the last year using those is a 30% increase in fuel efficiency, and the brakes nearly never wear out. So this is a lot of stuff that I'm giving you, and, 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 it, and so a lot of good um, knowledge and information about how to operate sustainably. Well, you can't do that in a vacuum. You really need to be able to express that and put it out so, so that there's a record of what you're doing and talk about your strategies moving forward and your goals. So we do that in two documents. We do that in a site sustainability plan that is required by the, by the Department of Energy. All of these, federal, these sustainability goals that I'm telling you about are, need to be fed to the Department of Energy. They put it into a, a, a strategic sustainability performance plan and send it up to CEQ and, and, and the Office of Management and Budget to look at how the federal government is meeting sustainability goals. We also do an annual sustainability report, and this is an older one, that is a little more, talks a little bit more about the achievements that this lab has had in the last year, some of the strategies we have moving forward. So you can find these, both of these documents on nrel.gov. Go to sustainability. You'll find some videos there and, and, and access to both of these documents. They get into all of the 38 sustainability goals. But I'm going to touch on just a few of them for you. So greenhouse gas reduction. Scope one and two greenhouse gas. Scope one is the amount of greenhouse gas that's generated on your site by uh, emissions that come off your site, like natural gas that you might be burning or fluorocarbons that you might use in, in the laboratory, uh, the, the, the fuel burnt on your fleet. Scope two emissions are those that are indirect emissions that come from off your site, primarily electricity from the grid. So if, uh, you know, 
if you're burning coal or, or, or natural gas in, in your region, we take that into consideration and that's what your scope to uh, greenhouse gas emissions are. Scope three greenhouse gas emissions are all those things that are kind of ancillary to how you do business, like your employee commuting, which is about 40% of ours, your employee travel, which is about the other 40%, and the other 20% is around transmission and distribution losses from grid electricity, and waste and wastewater. The goal for, uh, for last year was a decrease in, in scope three greenhouse gas emissions of 13% from a 2008 baseline. We did that, we were at a 14% increase. If there's a new executive order came out, the new goal is a 25% reduction. We're gonna have an extremely hard time meeting that, but uh, by, by 2025, so, so that's one of the things that we're looking at and strategizing. Uh, the goal for renewable energy is 7.5%. We're at 15% renewables. We were, when we opened this campus, and, and, and uh, before we, we brought on the energy systems integration facility, we were at 32%. But, but adding that building along with the supercomputer has added that much energy intensity, and right now we're about 15% of our electricity comes from renewables that are on site. Um, so to, to bring on more renewables and, and uh, especially um, PV, we've done a number of uh, power purchase agreements. Power purchase agreement is where you make an agreement with a company to come out and, and, and they install a PV system that they own and you buy the electricity from that PV system and the renewable energy credits can be sold separately to the state of Colorado for, to meet the state's renewable portfolio standard. In the state we voted in, uh, that we would have a 15% uh, portfolio of renewables in, in our electric grid by 2015. And then uh, Governor Ritter brought that up to uh, 30% by, by 2030, and that's where we're at now. And um, as I said, Excel is at 13%. So this was the first power purchase agreement done uh, in the Department of Energy. This PV array is up on the Mesa top. It's a 720 kilowatt system, single access system. Because we got into this power purchase agre agreement early in the, uh, in the renewable portfolio standard, well, Excel was paying very high rates for RECs. We actually play, pay less than grid power for, for the electrons coming off of this system. We've done four others since then. Um, we also have a renewable fuels heating plant, which is uh, basically a large wood burning stove. It burns chipped wood that uh, we are getting out of the beetle kill pine. In fact, one year we, um, we used all forest fire thinnings. So uh, really uh, a good use of, of wood. Um, and it, it, pro it provides about you know, 40% of the, the comfort heat that we have on site. Sustainable buildings, we, uh, we've talked a little bit about the research support facility. When we built this building, we uh, increased our ener energy intensity by 54%. Um, let, let, me, let me back up. We, we more than doubled the size of our of our uh, square footage on camp uh, on campus but we only increased the energy intensity by 16 percent so that is you know extremely good energy efficient building that and that doesn't even count the uh, the, the renewables on it uh, in the last 10 years we've built um, uh, seven buildings uh, all lead certified buildings the first was the first lead platinum building in federal government, the science and technology facility. The, uh, we also built the RSF. This is actually two buildings. We, the first part of the project was RSF one, these two wings, and then with ERA funding, when that came available, we were shovel ready for a, 
for the third wing. The last building was our energy systems integration facility. This facility is very interesting in that it's the only one in the United States that focuses on the efficiency of the grid and how do we make our 100-year-old grid smarter, update it, make it more energy efficient. We lose about 30% of the energy that's generated at a power plant before it actually turns to your light bulb. How do we manage that and how do we run appliances smarter where they come on when the electricity demand is lower in the morning and the evening. So, you know, um, that, that's what they're doing in, in that building there. Um, this is our uh, biofuels facility. It's, uh, it's an, it was an extension, lead gold, the ca lead platinum cafeteria. And with our south entrance road, that uh, small um, south entrance building is also, in addition to lead platinum, it's also a net zero energy building. We also built this big garage right in the middle of the campus to service the whole campus. If it were um, occupied, it would be a lead platinum building also. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of those um, facts here. Uh, so, so one of the things when, when, we, when we built this, and when we built all of our buildings, we do an architectural charrette, a national charrette. We bring in experts from all over to say, we're going to build this. How do we build the best? most sustainable, energy efficient building that we can. We take those ideas and we incorporate them into our design. So the garage came in, a couple of, uh, of design features that, 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 that I'll point out is, it's not a precast structure, it's a cast in place structure. We did that because it lasts longer, it's a better life cycle decision. And it also is nice and flat so you get good air movement through it and good light through it so that you don't have to over light it or to, to ventilate it. The ramps that take you up into the higher levels are in the middle of the, in the garage so that you get a good daylighting into the garage during the day, so less lighting needs. Uh, it uh, has LED lighting throughout the garage that's motion detected. So you might be, if you're one of the neighbors and you see that garage around Christmas time when, the, when, the, when we're still working here and it's dark, you see lights coming on and off because people are walking or driving through the building. Um, solar powered um, through the majority of the building and the south uh, entrance of the building. We've got, um, it's 90% of the, of the um, of, uh, 90 percent more efficient than the ASHRAE standard for parking structures. And then we have some incentive parking for van pools and car pools for low emitting vehicles. As I mentioned, 36 electric vehicle charging stations and a recycling drop off loop. When we built this, this uh, garage, there's, you know, some places with some glass in it here in the, in the stairwells and other places. And we looked at wanting to minimize the amount of bird kills. So you always end up when you have very large glass uh, uh, areas that birds will end up hitting them. You probably don't see them because they disappear pretty quick, quickly as the critters grab them. But one day I was walking past one of these structures before we had put this on. In fact, one of our biologists called me out to look at it. And you could see the imprint of a, of a hawk as he had flown right into the side of it and, and left like dust imprint on the side of that glass. He was probably chasing a mouse underneath it. And uh, after he hit the ground, probably a coyote or somebody picked him up pretty quickly. So one of the things we do is we, we put bird safe glass uh, on, all, on all of our um, major glass areas. This is the science and technology facility that I mentioned. We did a recommissioning of this building and found an $18,000 a year savings after only a 10, you know, when the building was only 10 years old, we were able to find that many savings by some of the new intelligent energy uh, products that uh, we've developed and that are out there. Talking about data centers a little, the data center that's in the research support facility uh, has a PUE, which is the power utilization equivalent. That is the amount of energy it takes to cool the computer versus to run the computer. It always takes a lot more. In fact, the data center that we had across the street when we were at Denver West had a PUE of 2.5, took two and a half times the amount of energy to cool the computer as it did to operate it. The one that's in there now takes 1.9. And the supercomputer in the ESIF is at a, is at a um, 
world record level of 1.06. It's one of the most energy efficient uh, computers in the world. It's water cooled, by the way. Um, so as I mentioned, to, be, to run smart energy, we, we look and monitor all of the energy systems that, that we have on campus. Where are we using power? Where is our renewables going um, in our buildings? And, and, and we do this when it, it's a system that we are building that helps us look at all of the energy use in different buildings and, and, and manage that in a smart manner. We've also developed a program where if we have an energy savings project that's going to save us over $10,000 a year, we can take that savings for as long as that project on goes and, and put it into a new energy efficiency projects. That's always a problem when, with when you're looking at big campuses is you might find energy efficiency, but the cost savings just goes into budget versus being able to, to use that money for new cost savings projects. When we rebuild all the, the buildings that we have, all these new buildings on our campus, we covered a lot of, of ground that was uh, permeable prior to that. So we wanted to make sure we were being good neighbors and managing our stormwater correctly. So um, we, we managed our, our landscaping with a sustainable design, with very low water use, native type plants. And, and we built a stormwater detention pond that has three different drainages. The center drainage rolls into this side. The, the east side of the campus uh, off this side rolls into here, and the west side of the campus rolls into there. It's built for basically a 100-year storm event. But these three little four bays that you see here are ver a very interesting design in that they have little concrete floors in them with, with holes in it that we planted wetland species in. So when the water comes in, rolls into here first, and it, and, it, and it detains for a while, and all of the heavy solids will roll out. And then it'll work its way down through the rest of the pond and evaporate or, or roll out. And then we can bring a skidster in here and clean these ponds out so that they don't over, overfill and, and our wetland species don't deteriorate. So the water, the quality of the water that leaves this site is thousand times cleaner than it was in the past from stormwater standpoint. When we had our big storm in 2013, that pond filled up three times and then slowly discharged across the, the uh, um, soccer fields there so that we really minimized that big surge flow that goes into Lena Gulch. If you go down to the Denver West uh, building area and, and during heavy rains, you'll see you know, a lot of flooding. Well, we've, we've really minimized that in the design of the stormwater pond. We pay a lot of attention to water, trying to minimize the amount of use, especially with the, with the supercomputer that, uh, that is water cooled. And our waste, we try and drastically minimize the amount of waste that goes into our landfills. So we compost all of the paper products and food products. Uh, we recycle to the maximum amount that we can. We currently divert 84% of the waste that would normally go into a landfill from, from the campus. Um, and then we're always looking for the small little things there. We did a waste audit and found that one of the things that we were seeing a lot of in our, in our waste is the plastic bags you get from grocery stores. So we came up with these little bag banks that are in each one of the kitchens. So instead of throwing your bag away, you put it in a bag bank and then you can take them to, re to, to reuse them or we take them all down and, and recycle them down at, at uh, King Supers. A, a lot of things like that, polystyrene. We're finding places that will accept polystyrene and so we're managing that, hauling it off. Fleet, same kind of thing. Uh, of, of the 32 goals that we had in, there were 28 goals in 2015. We met all of them, but, but fleet, petroleum, and, and we're working on that. I talked a little bit about scope three and, and employee commuting. So we do a number of things to try and help our employees get to work so in, a, in a way other than one person in one vehicle. We have carpooling, we have uh, van pool vouchers. Um, we, about 10% of our staff uh, bicycle on a, on a given day. So, you know, almost 200 people or so. So we have some bike lockers and covered parking places for bicycles.
And we also work to try and promote telecommuting and alternative work schedules, working a, a 410 schedule or something like that so you don't have to commute as much. I talked a little bit about our climate resilience planning. So that's kind of the big picture of NREL. Um, there's um, a great deal of information to be found on our website. Uh, the, the sustainability website is where you'll find our, our um, annual reports and site sustainability plans. And if you go just to nrel.gov and you look at uh, history, uh, right now you'll see a very nice article about the 40 years that we've been around and the, uh, some of our achievements and it'll, and it'll walk you down through a number of achievements, whether it's on batteries or hydrogen or, or solar or, or, or biofuels. Um, so that's kind of NREL in a, in a fairly good size overview. I'm sure you have a lot of questions about some of the research that we do and other things, but so I'll, I'll open it up to questions now.